All right. Good afternoon, good morning, and uh, some some other timing zone wherever you are in. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, topic with the title from atoms to Higgs boson, voyages in quasi space time. This is uh, the topic that we had for for a monograph which we wrote last year, published last year, the same title. Myself and my former student Christopher Polachik. He's now faculty member in, in the states, uh, United States. So I, I twisted his arms and then we uh, we brought this out. So I'm going to talk about just a summary of what we are trying to do, and especially with respect to Higgs boson, what is that we are trying to focus upon, what our concerns are, and so forth. So that's going to be my topic. And then uh, I'm notorious for speaking too fast, so I already asked John and others. If you feel I'm going too fast, don't hesitate to stop me, slow me down and ask me questions. And let's make it a bit more informal rather than just having to wait till the end. So there I got a small board, board of uh, topics here. Introduction, of course, like anything. And I'm going to talk about something, the confusion between the, the terms between space and geometry. And then we want to define what's called a quasi-realism, in fact. This is what we coined for what we consider to be the present day philosophy of physics. And I, after we coined this word for physics, we found out that psychologists also use the same term, but in a different meaning, different context. So we are not imitating their meaning, their context, because there is a society dependent argument that they try to use. Whereas we are talking about how we are approaching our uh, uh, quest to understand the nature, in fact. Then I'll try to spend some time on what's called, what we call the mathematical spaces. And I know mass is a very interesting topic to all of us here. So I'd like to talk about uh, mass and what is its role, if at all, if is it playing any significant role in the current day particle physics, especially particle physics. That's what we're looking at, in fact. And then we have got a grammatically incorrect way of saying what when an atom. And uh, we thought it was uh, when we coined this word, I thought, oh, my goodness, what are we trying to do here? But we found the same phrase was used by Sidney Drell also in one of the articles he wrote in Physics Today many decades ago. So we were kind of emboldened to use the same phrase. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about Higgs bosons and photons. And then of course Higgs boson is going to be one of the topics which you have to address because that is main, that's really what inspired us to write this book. It so happened in 2013 when I was at the San Diego conference and I did talk about Higgs boson. That was a year after it was announced to have been discovered. And then uh, the editor, uh, the publisher of this particular uh, uh, company was uh, in the audience apparently. So then he approached me a few weeks later asking me if I could organize a monograph like this. And that was really the stimulus, stimulus which we had to write this monograph. So naturally, there's a, some epilogue as a conclusion, basically. That's what I'm going to do. All right. First of all, a disclaimer. Disclaimer: uh, We are not proposing any new theories. So this is you no. Know, if you are looking for something that I'm going to say, this is my theory. I'm going to discover and explain the entire universe. Sorry, you'll be disappointed. We are not doing anything of that kind, and we are also not claiming that we are any smarter than our predecessors, or we are no more genius. We are not considered to be genius than other, or earlier or present times. Maybe in the future also. We are just. Simple people working on physics, dedicated, but they devoted our lives to doing physics. So we have some questions, honest questions. When we hear, when we do our own work, when we write the papers, when we listen to all the other people, what they have done, what they've been talking about from the antiquity till now, in fact, it's not just limited to what's happening in the late 20th century, but we spend some time to go back and read the original articles, uh, original papers, what they were trying to say, what they were meaning, whether they meant what they really said, et cetera, et cetera. So we are asking some questions. And then we try to somewhat kind of, we try to give some kind of a criticism of those things, hopefully not in a, in a negative way, but then uh, we strongly feel that uh, the younger generation who is going to be lured into this profession of particle physics, especially or cosmology astrophysics, should be made aware that the terminology that is used in today's physics is it really not what they really meant to be. They don't even mean that, and then use it in many different ways. So one has to be very careful about it, and then before they get into the into this business, in fact. Uh, 
Now, first of all, thing is what we got the space versus geometry. This is it might it might it might look like a very silly thing to ask. Do we understand what is the space and what is the geometry? And in this, we want to quote what Niels Bohr once said: "It is our task is to learn the use of the words." He's not necessarily speaking he's talking about space and geometry. He's talking about any words that we use in quantum physics, modern physics. In fact, we should learn how to use these words correctly, that is, unambiguously and consistently. Regret, regrettably, we have moved away quite a long ways from that kind of a consistent use of the terminology. And uh, that is really troublesome, in fact. So first of all, I'd like to make it very clear, obvious to us, of course, if I say, say Charlie, what are we talking? We knew this one. We know the geometry is not synonym of a space. But the thing is, it used like that. Riemannian space, Euclidean space, we use that type of terminologies. Euclid was never giving a space, he was giving us geometry. Yeah, that's only planar geometry, in fact, that's all he was doing. So we should remind ourselves that when we use these two terms as synonyms, we're making a mistake. The geometry is used simply to describe the shape of confined space. If you don't have the boundaries, there is no geometry to speak of, in fact. And, and if, you have, if you have got an empty space without any bound, any contents, or without any boundaries, in fact, then it has no geometry. This is exactly what we're trying to say in the, in, the, in the same way, in fact. So one has to be very careful about this one. This has been a big problem in physics. Um, it did start now. It started back in 19th century, in fact. That, that's, what, that's what happened. So that has been used. And uh, Euclid, uh, maybe we should, if you're European, Germanic, we should be calling it Euclid, I guess, but let's call it Euclid. That's what we always call it again. This is the guy who started off with what's called the Euclidean geometry. That is a 300 uh, BC, basically, you know, before Christ. I guess, almost 2,300 years ago, he started like this one. What he did was very interesting. He started off with, with five postulates. By the way, this particular book which he wrote, or the thing which he did, was used for about 2,000 years. Maybe after Bible or after Quran and things like that, maybe this was one of the best selling books in the, in the history of the <laughs> civilization, I guess. So what he, there is a five postulates, and the fifth one says like this. It's called a parallel postulates. When do you call two lines parallel? Of course, he's talking about the planar geometry. He's not talking about the 3D of systems, of course. So he talks about saying, okay, if a straight line is falling on two straight lines, makes the interior angle. So if like, I mean, here, I've got a picture here. So there are the two straight lines which are inclined to each other, and we're drawing one other line which is intersecting these two lines. And then look at the interior angles A and B, which we call them interior angles on this side here. And then his postulate will tell you if you extend the lines to, to the right hand side of my screen here, and they will meet somewhere, and they are not parallel. And if this is going to be perpendicular to each other, of course, A and B are not, not, uh, not less than 180, 90 degrees, then of course they're not going to meet. They're going to be divergent, they're going to be parallel. That's what you would call it. So this is the fifth postulate. So this is looks like a very simple thing, in fact, to do. And but then there's a lot of problem, in fact. So if these are the five postulates which we have here. So there are four behind the last one is the fifth postulate, of course. So then think got interesting to the people. What they tried to do was the people started right after he made this postulate. First movement was to disprove him. Boy, the fifth postulate is wrong. That's what they were trying to do initially to begin that one. And this movement to disprove the Euclid lasted nearly two millennia. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting to me when I look at that one. So first is, like I said, they wanted to prove him wrong. Then they said, okay, okay, it's, if it's not wrong, it's not necessary. So let us try to prove that it's going to be redundant so that first four postulates which we have here are enough to deduce the fifth one, in fact. So if we want to look at some names who were in, involved in this, so Procla separately, I never heard this name guy before this one, but it's about 400 uh, modern era. And then Ibn al Hatim, 900, the 10th century, in fact, Omar Khayyam, 11th century. There are many other names in between, in fact. I'm just picking up a few names here and there. And uh, Vitali uh, in uh, say 17th century and so forth, these people have done that. It's interesting to see how they were spread out. They were spread out in uh, coming from Arabic world towards the Western European world also. They were all trying to either disprove him, or basically they were trying to disprove him, or they're trying to prove him to be redundant, so you don't need the fifth postulate. And in the 19th century, we've got famous names of course, Lobachevsky, Bolyai, and Gauss. These people also were very much involved. 
apparently Beltrami was the guy who proved that fifth apostle is not redundant. <laughs> that was interesting also to notice that. And the other guys were basically trying to say how to overcome or circumvent this particular thing and then moved on to that. What they did was really very interesting, in fact. So instead of uh, disproving him, instead of uh, making it redundant, they went on to discover a new geometry, in fact, a non-Euclidean geometry, not space. This is, this is something which people do talk about, oh, Euclidean space and non-Euclidean. Of course, Euclidean was never talking about space. He was talking about geometry. Now, of course, we know what we have here, hyperbolic geometry, spherical geometry, elliptical geometry. We can bring in all kinds of geometries which, which we have. These are the 3D uh, imaginations, of course, not necessarily, not confined to one plane in the in the sense of Cartesian systems or Euclidean systems, in fact. And then, of course, then you say, okay, the, yeah, the, 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 the planar, uh, which, uh, we always know the total angle, some of the angles is equal to 180 degrees. Now we can say, if I go to the different, the uh, dimensionalities, I can have less than 180 or greater than 180, I can call them elliptical, hyperbolic, spheroidal, or whatever you want to call it, of course. That's what we have done that. And it's very, very useful, very advantageous. And we, we had recognized, in, as physicists, we are constantly aware of this advantage. When I'm trying to understand some conservation principles, and I'm trying to find out the proper geometry to work with, in fact, I look for to see, am I going to work with Cartesian system? Am I going to with the spherical polar coordinate system? Or I'm going to put the cylindrical geometries? What am I going to use this one? If I want to really find out angular momentum conservation principles, of course, we all know the spherical polar coordinate system is the best one to work with, in fact. Because I'll, I mean, neither I can go back and find out what is the uh, what is the cyclic coordinate and then tell you conjugate moment is going to console or not console. I can find out, uh, right? So this is one of the things which we have. So it is not to undermine the contributions of all these people, Riemann, Gauss, and all the other people who have given us these mathematical tools to use the multidimensional geometries. But it does not undermine the value of the Euclidean, nor disprove what the Euclid has done that. Let's not forget this guy was doing 2000, 2,300 years ago and then giving us a planar geometry. Of course, we have come far ways from the, from the geometries and we are doing that. But there should be no confusion whatsoever about the, 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 the language that we are using and should never call this, uh, this spheroidal space, in fact, non-Euclidean space does not make any sense. Okay, the space has not changed. It is a geometry which we changed, of course, which has changed. So that is something which you want to take it away. So it, it has always been the same thing. Okay. Now, this, again, the quasi-particle approach is the one that was brought into solid-state physics. I would like to also argue after when I think about maybe the quasi-realism quasi approach probably has come even before that, in fact. And John is an expert of quasi-particle approach. And so I would not have to go deep, deep into that for one. I also uh, worked with that for some time in the nuclear physics, we use that one. We borrowed from the solid-state physics. And the same thing was borrowed into particle physics, in fact, without acknowledging it. At least in the nuclear physics, when we approach the quasi-particle methods, uh, we acknowledged with that we, we have got the BCS approximation, superfluid systems, we are doing kind of a thing, and we can make the ap approximations of truncating the Hilbert space and then do those things. We have always done that for in fact. But particle physics has done that, borrowed it, but never acknowledged it. That's where the problem really comes. So what are we trying to do here for those people? Who, well, please bear with me if this is too obvious to you. But what we are trying to say, you got a microscopically very complicated mini body system, n body system, which you have got in, in, in even in our limitation, which you got there. Suppose I take a nucleus of atomic number Z and particle number A as a first approximate second, I got A bodies, of course. The A body can be anything from one to 200, 300, in fact, what you got. Even in that limit of very tangible particles, which I see there, that's already too many bodies, in fact. This not really many systems with the even there are only two body systems which are accurately solved three bodies are already complicated there's a fuzzy approximation which we can go and try to do certain things about it but the moment we have got this a problem three body interactions right from the newton's times we are still struggling with that so but what the quasi particle approach does is a very very good thing in fact what it does is it allows you you are making an, an effective model, effective mean field approximation, effective theories, effective models, what we want to call that one. What we say is, yeah, there is a central 
entity there, but there are only a few bodies which are moving around in this mean field. I can treat them as I as I can find them to bound in, the, in this mean field, or even as a free entities, in fact. But then I can give them some effective mass, effective charge, effective things, which need not necessarily corresponding to what we call the nominal mass. So that means if I pick up my particle data book and I see the 938.3 mu over c squared, the mass of the proton, or 0.511 mu is the mass of the electron, I don't have to use that. I'm completely free to use whatever I want to use, in fact. And that's the kind of a freedom which we get, but we still use the same terminology. We still call that an electron, we still call it a proton, we still call it a neutron, and so on and so forth. And we communicate that with other people in, in within our profession and outside also. So, so electrons, electrons become the quasi-particles. And the, if you think about the plasma physics people, you are looking at that one, are you looking at that? even the solid state physics people, transistors and et cetera, et cetera, what you got all these guys, they're all, they're all looking at the electrons as a quasi-particles. And then you have got this phonons, copper phase, plasmons, magnons, et cetera, et cetera. You can all build it into this one, which are not necessarily tangible things that you can see there, but you've got their effects, which you can feel in terms of, you can model, you can get them. But do they really still talk about the electron? Am I still talking about electron there? Not necessarily, because if it does not have the mass of an electron, if it does not have the charge of an electron, if it tells, if I still call it an electron, is it an electron? If I don't do that one, I cannot get a meaningful result to describe my experiments. Of course, a very powerful tool. Nobody denies that. But does it really reflect what J.J. Thompson's electron is? So when we think about this one, we have to think about what, where we are going in fact, I just to summarize it in one slide here. There are four kinds of approach, in fact, three things which we talk, we commonly hear about it. We are the fourth one to that. We have realism, empiricism, positivism, and quasi-realism is what we recently added to this list of things we have to think about in fact. So realism will tell you, all right, we should really think about what is happening in the nature, and then we can use that one want to come up with the word, the, uh, the, the cosmology, the, we can think about the how to understand the nature basically. So, so this the, the realism tries to tell you that whatever you are trying to use the reality, this is, does not depend upon what you were, your scheme is, your perception, your language, your religion, should be all independent of those things in fact. So to do that particular kind of an empiricism will provide you a means of doing that if you want to call that way, that you've got the data that you could use this one so to, to accomplish the realism. Positive, positivism tries to take you one step further than that. It says, okay, after you have got the empiricism, the, the data, which was the basis for your realism, you can perhaps extend the knowledge beyond what the data tells you in fact, but it still is going to be something which is going to be based upon the natural phenomena. So I must still re restrict to that in fact. So what we call quasi-realism is the following. It's a philosophical perspective on the science, which says is the, the, it identifies unphysical mathematical convenience. There is no really physical reality in the mathematical effects I'm writing there, but I'm imposing them, the mathematical convenience, because it's easy for me. Hilbert, truncated Hilbert space is a very good example, of course. Well, the particles, we call them quasi-particles. So I'm taking a mathematical convenience, which makes my life very easy. I can make some parameter fitting, describe my data, what we've got there, but then I will run with that and I declare that I have understood something in terms of the, of the nature, in fact. That's what we define as a quasi-realism, in fact. So this is, we try to pretend that they have got the real existence in the physical world. That's a question, that's a concern. Do they really belong to the physical world or is something which is my conceptual understanding based upon my mathematical convenience? Okay, first quasi-realism came in 4D space time. What happened here? We had we had X, Y, Z, I, C, T. We wrote these four things in fact. First and foremost, unlike the special components, the time is not an independent observable. How do I measure time? It's, it involves a motion. Position coordinates, string of frequency, oscillations of a, of a, this, uh, the, a pendulum, or the motion of sun. Where was the sun in the, yesterday and where is the sun today? Oh, I call it one day. So measurement of time involves special, special understanding, special quantification. 
So time does not become an independent observable. It, then it cannot have a, a, a same status as special coordinates. Simple. Now the multiplicative factor, oh, now the, they, they gave me C as a multiplicative factor to put me there. You know, the multiplicative factor C there is not a linearly independent variable. That's fundamental requirement of mathematical formulation of the degrees of the of number of uh, uh, the, the dimensionality, of course, right? All the components I'm going to put there as a specifying my dimensionality must be linearly independent. However, my C comes because an observer will call it a delta R over delta T. Another observer in a different fr frame would call it a delta R prime over delta T prime. But we tell them, Come on, calibrate your rulers, calibrate your clocks, such that you get the C as the answer to be the multiplicative factor here. Now the C depends on all four of them. Right? It's not, it's not just, just, it's not just, see, so we have a problem here basically in terms of our understanding of what the dimensionality really means. We are not even obeying the fundamental principle of mathematics, which requires the linearly independent variables. We don't have that. We lost it. So, so that's what we're saying. Each observer should recalibrate their rulers and their clocks to get the value C and multiply that factor and then define their coordinates. Oh, that's really now. This is one thing. By the way, what do I say there? Einstein wrote speed of light, the C which we wrote is a constant in empty space. I went around and read his papers, in fact, 1905. That light is always propagated in empty space with a definite velocity c, which is independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. Look at what he says there. It's only he's requiring about the most state of motion, state of motion of the emitting body. In fact, I went back to his German article to see whether the, sometimes you know when when we see the English translations, they are not really accurately translated. So I really had to check that. And then I did find that it really comes to that solution layer and from a state smith and Westington from Bergen's standard. This emitted and then Kerpers and Hun Abhang again, Geschwind Kite, V4 France. So he's saying this is the one, it's independent. Exactly what he said in, in, in English language, very accurately translated from, the, from his German version of 1905, in fact. By the way, this is what really bothered me a little bit, in fact. This statement about the state of the speed of light being independent of the state of motion of an emitting body was known or was used pre-relativity era by astronomers. These people were trying to find out the locations and this, the distances of the stars from, from wherever we were observing, in fact. So then they had a problem. So if you are going to use the light, the time it takes or the light velocity or the Doppler shift or whatever we have as a measure of the distance and so forth, if we don't know what the speed of the light is, if we don't know where the source is and how fast it is going, you could not really determine. It's, it's an unsolvable problem, in fact. So a tacit assumption that they made already was that the speed of light was independent of the state of the motion of the emitting body, in fact. So this is, becomes a postulate in Einstein. He takes it there. But this is already a common assumption in astronomical observations of uh, 19th century and earlier, in fact. After we have done that, we say empty space does not exist. You say, what are you talking about? You try to tell me for 100 years, empty, the speed of light is constant in empty space, speed of light is constant in empty space, that of in emitting body. And of course, didn't talk in, talking anything about the observer, of course, with, that may, might have come later on. But then, then 10 years later, you turn around and say, oh, by the way, I told you it's an empty space, but you don't have any empty space. Why are we talking about something which does not exist? You see, it's troubles. So mathematical spaces. Again, this is because we're still talking mathematical space. A mathematical function, like I mentioned already, this is, I, I'm talking to mathematics, so I should be very careful about that. I know that. So this is basically this is what I was taught when I was the undergraduate student. So that's what exactly I'm repeating, basically. A mathematical function of any indi linearly independent variable spans an n-dimensional exists. So the number of linearly independent variables dictates my dimensional space, in fact, what you got there. So a simple example, but, it's, but the thing is, but if you got a, a vector space, it does not necessarily represent a physical space. This is something which you have to be very careful about, in fact. I'll give one simple example, which is a common everyday example, in fact. Here it is, electrical engineering example. We again teach in the first year, second year, electrical magnetism. You got Harry, the Harry, Harry, Sorry? 
this is very exciting and you're getting very excited, but you're getting so fast. <laughs> oh, sorry. I should, no, thank you. So, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, thank you, John. I, like I said, please slow me down because I, otherwise I'm going to run with it. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> oh, thank you. So this is what we have here. So what's happening? You know, we, we use the circuitry, uh, resistances, capacitances, inductances, radios, and TVs, etc., etc. Everywhere we got all the circuitry. In fact, these days, and the uh, engineers we teach them. So you can write down the inductance uh, impedance which we have here as a reactance and resistance which you have there. I can draw as a XY plot. Resistance is a real component which is going to be X axis. And the reactance which you have is going to be omega L whole square, omega C whole square, and then do that one. I don't think any electrical engineer will ever say to me that this is a two dimensional space spanned by the reactance and the impedance, right? So so, 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 so simply because I can represent my problem as an n-dimensional linear vector space or geometry or whatever you want to call, that does not necessarily, it's, it's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition to call it the physical space. And that's, I think that's, maybe I'm belaboring too much on that, but this is the point which I did anything about it. And as I already mentioned, 4D space time does not meet this basic mathematical requirement. It doesn't meet that. In, in modern physics, we got many mathematical spaces, of course. Hilbert space, Feigen states, which we have, of course, we all know that. And isospin, Heisenberg uh, introduced in 1933, 32, around that time, right after the time when the neutron was discovered, then we have, he brought it in. This is isospin, he brought it up. Then, of course, phase space, we commonly use that one, of course. And you know, back in 1970s and the 80s, the chaos and fractals became a big thing, in fact. And then they used to pre prepare all these diagrams with the momentum space and so forth, showing the, the branchings and bifurcation and so forth. And then people always used to ask me the question, what is this? What is going on here, in fact? That's a mathematical space. But it was never clearly explained to the public or other people, because that was selling very much, in fact. And we've got the complex spaces, of course. I has been some favorite topic for our uh, discussion in the last few weeks. And I was also, uh, interestingly, I, mean, I was watching those things out. Then, of course, string theory is there. String theory says it has got 26 dimensions for bosonic strings and 10 dimensions, 10 dimensions for the fermion strings, in fact. So, what a, so wait a minute, wait a minute. What are we talking about here? So the particle should know whether it's a, if it's a fermion or a boson, and then it has to decide how many dimensions it can span. And then uh, if there are, if, if, are they overlapping with respect to each other, or otherwise fermions should be banished from the 16 dimensions of uh, which are accessible to bosonic strings? Second class citizens, third class citizens, what is that? Territorial ambitions, what's going on here? And why, why would that be dependent upon what particles I'm dealing with? It's dimensions are dimensions. Okay, so that much, so much about that discussion because, like you have John said, I, I can go on this. But uh, this is, now look at the mass. Mass is another thing which I've been talking a lot in our discussion. In fact, this is something which we will also spend quite some time about it. Uh, well, Newton, if you go back to Newton, of course, everybody wants to talk about him. This is good. A physical MA, he said. But the thing is very simple. At that time when he was working, the, the whole world was simply mechanical thing. That's, the, that's all they had to worry about. So you got a gravitation thing, and then everything was mechanical, and everything was elastic. Inelastic things were also not required. So that's, 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 that was the adequate operational definitions. In fact, Newton's three laws of motion are nothing but operational definitions of how to do that. That's one of the reasons, even in the 21st century, now the engineers still work with that in fact right they, they never use relativity if you are working for our common mechanical engineers or electrical engineers electrical engineers might bring in the electricity to some extent but anything mechanical motion they're still working with the newtonian mechanics because that's very good operational definition at that limit but now when we bring in the lorentz force or well, then we got we said then we said we've got non-mechanical force are also present electric fields magnetic fields etc we got there and then it links to that one. The other day, yesterday, I was pointing it out. This is really always amazed me, in fact. There is no charge without mass, but there's mass without charge. So whenever you're bringing in the electrical magnetic uh, aspects, there's always mass attached to those entities, in fact. And we cannot really completely disentangle and remove those things, in fact. That's what the Lorentz force does. Simply, it will tell you how to 
connect uh, uh, electric forces, magnetic forces with respect to mechanical th things that can happen, and so forth, which you got. In particle physics, where I spend a lot of my time, we make extensive use of the Lorentz force. In fact, we do we use it a lot. In fact, we require that a lot for everything which we do. In fact, I tell my students when I'm teaching accelerator physics or beam, beam optics or detectors, things which you got, all you need to know is Lorentz force equation. That is your starting point. If you don't know that, forget about the whole thing. But if you start from that one, then you can build yourself up into go to this. That's a very fundamental thing which we require. So we write down. Uh, for example, if you have got F is equal to QB cross B, we have particle moving in a magnetic field, and which is going to be mag um, mass times of acceleration, it's going to be a radius of uh, curvature, which is going to follow an angular acceleration, so on and so forth. You should do that. So this is what we use. But the thing is, and we use it a lot in, to measure the mass of the stable particles. For example, if I've got, if I'm doing an experiment, which I do uh, in Japan most often these days, good old days I used to do it in Germany also besides Canada. In all these cases, we build the spectrometers, we bend the particles, and then we, we measure the momenta for the given magnetic field by their trajectories, and we assign what the masses are for a given momentum, knowing the speed, et cetera, et cetera, we do that one. We do that. But this is good for only stable and long-lived particles, in fact. Long-lived charged particles. That's the only way we can use that one. But anything short-lived is not accessible to that. But we have invented something using the relativity as an argument, which we said, okay, what we call invariant mass. Invariant mass, I'm suppressing all the Cs, of course. I don't need to write that one. So I'm just showing the, the skeleton equation which we have there. I say m squared is equal to e squared minus p squared is equal to e squared minus e squared beta squared is equal to m square gamma square one minus beta. So it comes out to be that way. So we say, ha, I just dis discovered the invariant mass because m square is equal is independent of the gammas. What I basically did was I begged my equations and then I miraculously, I can calculate gamma squared with one minus beta square. And so there's a cancellation of plus m square appears as m, m square, as long as I take energy to be the total energy and the momentum as a measure in the Lorentz uh, force equation, in fact, that's what we got. As long as I do that, this satisfies for their conditions. So if when we, so we try to define with respect to the, these particles, which are, then we can also put a, an ensemble of particles and then take the collective vector momenta, collective scalar energy sums, square them, subtract out the, as it properly, and then decide that. The figure I have here is we, we used to call them, as, I still call that in fact, it's called the Mona Lisa of part, particle physics. This is uh, an experiment which was done in uh, Brookhaven in 1960s. And they were trying to discover a particle which is called, you know, if you look at this part, the diagram here, where the very bottom, a K minus meson is coming into the bubble chamber. And in the bubble chamber is filled with hydrogen uh, liquid, of course, it's what we have there. And then they were looking for a particle which is called the omega minus. This omega minus is what we have there. And this particular particle leaves for about 10 to the minus 12 seconds. It's very long lived in that sense. But still, it goes for a very short distance. As you can see, it is produced at the point A, what I marked as A there, and goes up to the point B onto that polar one. And then it tries to, it decays into several particles, in fact, K0, pi, sigma 0, pi minus, gamma, lambdas, etc. All the things come out. So whenever you see a solid line here, that's what I'm using my magnetic spectrometers to reconstruct the trajectories of the particles which are flying there. And then from there, I try to reconstruct all the dashed ones, which are not seen in my experiment, but I can reconstruct it uh, from the solid lines, which I see there. And then I can measure their energies. I can measure their momenta. And then I got there, what they're identified there. From all the ensembles that we have corrected here, I can reconstruct what the mass of the omega minus is, what the energy of the omega minus, everything I can tell about it. It's a beautiful mathematical this thing. It works very well. Nothing wrong with that. This is exactly the way we, we identify all the resonances, all the particles, and all the things which we are doing. Stable charge particle are long lived. It doesn't have to be completely stable if it's long lived. I can always detect them, their trajectories, reconstruct them in a magnetic field. But when we've got very short lived ones, then I can use the products of the decays of those particles and they and measure their kinematics and from their kinematics i can reconstruct the parent particle or resonance whatever you want to call it in fact this is what we have done very successful enterprise and i myself was involved in many many aspects of doing this kind of in my own life in fact but then more recently we have come one step further down in terms of our rigor in fact if you want to call that 
More recently, this has become, mass became simply a parameter to fit the cross-section data. So I measure the cross-section under different kinematic or dynamic conditions, make the plots of the, the, the cross-sections which I measure, and, and I will try to ask my models to tell me what are the best mass I can deduce from the data I have there. So this is no longer either the invariant mass fit nor the original Lorentz force fit impact. We have gone one step further away from what we can call as a measurement of mass. It is a deduction of mass based upon my model arguments for a parameter which I think to uniquely determine my mass parameter, of course. QED test. We hear a lot about the, how the QED has been a fantastic model which has been turned, tested to up, up to umpteenth decimal point or whatever it is. Is that so really? Did we really do that? That's the question which you wanted to ask in fact. One of the fundamental things which people talk about is the electron magnetic dipole moment, of course. This is a very famous parameter. And then it is now quoted the electron uh, moment is called minus 1.0011. You can go up to the 12th decimal point as what you are there with an uncertainty about 26 at the last two decimal point, this de decimal points which you have there. So we're going up the 12th decimal point also. And it's claimed to be the biggest success of the quantum electrodynamics test. Is it? That's the question which you're asking. Look at what Dirac has done initially. He said, all right, there's an electron which we have there, put it in an external magnetic field. It's exchanging a virtual photon and that virtual photon interaction with respect to, with the, with the charged particle can be uh, kind of a quantified in terms of the magnetic dipole moment, which is the property of the electron. That's what he did. And when he did that, he got minus 1.00. So he got up to, uh, up to the second decimal point, in fact. But the measurement at that time gave us 1.0011, in fact. That's what they had, 116 or something like that, which he got there. So soon after Dirac's calculation, I think in 1940s, Schwinger said, so wait, wait a minute. So if you think about it, Dirac's uh, approach is going to be the first order perturbation, in fact. So then Schwinger came up and said, let's make one more approximate. Let's take the Dirac term and plus add up one more term, which is going to be an electron which is approaching the magnetic field in the vicinity of the magnetic field, in the field of the magnetic field, kind of emits a virtual photon, which is reabsorbed by the electron itself. And then let's calculate this term, in fact. That's what he has done. And by the time he did that, he already got 1.0011, in fact. He already did that. That's the second order perturbation, which are already doing that. Then people have uh, jumped onto the bandwagon and then they increase the orders of perturbation. So that just, then you got a third order perturbation, fourth order, they're up to over 10th order perturbation right now. They've been calculating right now, in fact. And as you can see what happens is the moment, what is happening in the third, third order perturbation, you've got a photon which is coming, in you know, the electron which is coming here. It is emitting two photons at two different time points, in fact. One is absorbed by the, at the, at the where the virtual photon was re-emitted, of course, whereas the second one has gone past the interaction region and then grab down to the electron again before the electrons are the real world. That's how we're doing. So the moment you increase the number, the order, your number of diagrams for each order also will increase. So I got only one diagram for the of, uh, Dirac and also got wrote only one diagram for the Schwinger. But then by the time I come to here, there are more diagrams I can put in for the second, third order perturbation, in fact. So fourth orbit will have even more, et cetera, et cetera, I can build upon that. Not only that, you see one thing here that you have to look at one more diagram here, which you do here. The one, the, the bottom most one, which I wrote in this picture here, has got this virtual photon emitted and then becomes a bubble. And what is in the bubble? Particle antiparticle pairs. That could be quarks, anti quarks, lepton, anti leptons, hadrons, anti hadrons, mesons, anti mesons. What are you want to put in there? And once you put in there, what are you doing there? That's no longer QED. The interaction of those particles among them so to be created and annihilated also depends upon the QCD, weak interaction, et cetera, et cetera. So I have gone away from the quantum electrodynamics the moment I put in those diagrams. But I'm telling the world I'm testing QED. Excuse me, are you? And this is a race between the experiment and the theory to go on, to go on, to go on, to go on to higher and higher order diagrams. The calculations for this one, I know the gentleman who has done this one, he has spent 
very much he dedicated his life i kind of my hats off for him he has spent 50 years of his life using the most powerful computers of the day even still his groups are working on that in fact calculating this for the 10th order to go for beyond or whatever you want to call that which you got on that form and i would say what did i learn about the nature did i really understand my electron any better any more than what Dirac or Schwinger told me? How many of the colleagues of these people are working on that? Can they understand and check these calculations? Either analytically or computationally. Oh, this is one of the beautiful pictures you'll find in the sun reviews and seven pictures and so forth. This is the uh, electron-positron collisions. Before the LHC, they used to have got the Lepin for large electron-positron collider, which is shut down in, uh, in 2000, before 2000, to give way to the, this one which you have here. So this is the electron-positron central mass energies which you have here. You are starting about, uh, about 100 MeV or some such kind of a thing which you have at the left-hand side on the horizontal axis, going all the way to about 200 GeV which you have there. And look at the uh, vertical axis which you have here, the cross sections which are going all the way from about 10 to the power minus two to the 10 to the power minus seven, six orders of magnitude. Where is it you got? And then what you'll find is the beautiful structures, very, very lovely data which you got there. This is not necessarily all the data from the lap itself, but it came from several places, but it's all summarized here in one picture, which which is seven uses a lot. This is pretty beautiful, in fact. So you got this data which is taken. You find that uh, rho omega, omega, uh, rho meson, omega meson, phi meson, rho prime meson, and then you got the J psi, psi, epsilonium, and Z, in fact, all these things. The structures are coming corresponding to the names which are given to us. By the way, I don't know how many of you know the J psi is uh, the 1973. It was uh, 73, they got the Nobel Prize, I think. Maybe it was discovered a bit earlier than that, 70, 74, maybe 74, around that time anyway. You know the, what the J stands for? It was it, it discovered by two people at the same time. One is the Cornell, uh, he was working at the Brookhaven, I think that's, that's called J. Sam Ting. Sam Ting was a professor at MIT or Harvard, one of those places anyways. And the Psi was a discovered, Psi at the same time was a, a Bud Rister in Stanford. They have they are both I didn't discover at the same time. J in Chinese reads as a ding. The group leader of the, this team, which was discovered, which discovered this in uh, uh, I think it was in um, Cornell. Yeah, it was in Cornell. Was Sam Ting. I had a student who came from China. Her name was Ding, and I asked her once she came to my office and I asked her, "Can you write your name, a Chinese character for your name?" She immediately wrote J there on the thing. Right? And uh, Sam is a very well accomplished physicist, in fact, but I could not understand. Well, I could not uh, really, even today, I cannot accept his, his ego, basically, to call the particle from, by his family's name has, has given to it. Anyway, now let's, but our discussion is not about that. Look at these structures. How do we understand these structures? Is what I say. Okay, rho omega phi rho prime. They're also made up of, like, a, you say, okay, the phi is made up of the SS bar quark, omega is made up of, of the UD quarks, UD bar quarks, and so on. But the location of those mesons, they're called mesons, of course, so the location of those mesons has nothing to do directly with the mass of the constituent quarks. Nobody would say that because omega is at about 700 MeV, the quarks are 350 MeV or whatever. Nobody says that. Similarly, because phi is made up of SS bar quark, nobody would say S quark is equal to 500 MeV. In fact, S quark is a certain mass of 140 MeV or some such kind of thing. So no, no direct correlation between the masses of these mesons and so forth, which you got there. But the moment we got the J psi, which is a very narrow structure. You see that it's almost like a delta function, which is just going up there. And we say, ah, this is a CC bar quark, and it appeared at 3.2. So C quark has a mass of 1.7 GeV. We declared that. We did not declare that for the, the ones before. But the moment we came here, by the way, we said, this is the, not a particle, this is a resonance. This has got two particles inside here. And then we got other ones. Same thing happened with Upsilonium. Upsilonium, we said, oh, the moment we saw the very sharp curves here, oh, this is not a particle. This is a resonance. And this is a resonance which has got the bottomonium, which we call the BB bar quarks are made up of. So B quark is equal to 5 GeV. 
we assigned a mass for them. See, initially we've got no correlation between the location of these resonances, mesons which we have got there, with respect to the mass of the constituent cause which you defined there. But the moment we came with the JPSI and we said, okay, these are the ones. And we, but these are very sharp structures, much sharper than the omega and phi and things like that. But we say, oh, they are not particles because they are resonance, because I told you it's a resonance. But there is a rule of thumb. This is what I got on the, on the writing. Narrower a structure is more likely it is to be a particle. And 10 to the power minus 21 seconds, if you take that one, there's a 1 mu wide. And there's a strong interaction time scale. And none of the things which are really going with the strong interaction stage, which can be unstable, do live for longer time. They are not really long lived, in fact. We don't, we don't have them. Generally speaking, also a rule of thumb is if the lifetime is more than 10 to the power minus 13 seconds, like a picoseconds of the order, whatever we got there, longer than a fraction of a picosecond, that means corresponding width of this in this one, all Heisenberg principle is going to give me less than one electron volt, it's likely a particle. If I look at that way, I would have thought, I would think my Wipsilonium JPSI would be a particle rather than being the quark quark composites, in fact. Oh, no, 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 we told you that's not the case. This is what you got there. But look at the Z particle, Z which you got here. This is a Z boson, famous Z boson. That's 2 GeV. But that's a particle. Why are you saying that? This is so huge, so wide. It tells me this lifetime is 24 minus 25 seconds. So despite the large width, because I wanted it to be a particle, I call it a particle. So speak of the Z boson. Mass is 91.18. This PDG will give you that. Width is 2.49. I take it from the literature, not much. Tau is 24 minus 20 seconds. Is this a particle? And if this is a particle solely, the, the purpose of the jet boson was basically to be mediator of the weak interactions. That's how we invented it. It came for that purpose. Why this particle, which I designed for the weak interaction, is such a hurry to die by strong interaction? Why am I doing that? Not only that, Z boson is not a pure configuration. It has got the neutral component corresponding to the isovector projection of the W3, as we call that one, and the B component, which we call that's a 0.5. So that's has about 30%, 20% of uh, uh, the isoscalar component in that one, which is uh, purely electromagnetic quantum. Now, my photon which I was always telling to be electromagnetic quantum has got again 30% of the, uh, the weak component, and then it has got only 80, 70% of uh, electromagnetic component. I achieved electro unification, electro weak unification by denying the purity of a photon. And now look at the Z boson, which we just came across. And I call the fleeting avatars of Z boson, in fact. You can look at what is happening. These are all the diagrams I can write. A Z boson in its lifetime as it is going, of course, by the way, you don't see it directly. You can only see from the products. Of it. You never see it in the laboratory flying. You can never catch it in a detector. It does not happen. But within the time that is, uh, if it's already fleeting, even within that short life that, that it has got yes, to this one, it could become a bubble diagram QQR. It could become WW, it could become ZH, it can, it can, it can have got many components. These are the different authors, the different scenarios which you can be. If you ask me what, and it can become a photon, right? Because it's the photon component also. If I now ask people, what is really Z boson? What should I tell them? If it is there. What is photon anyways? Well, we have a classical wave. That's the first on the top. Again, I've got a diagram set to show what it is here. It has got a virtual electromagnetic wave. Uh, that's what we have been taught, and we still teach, and we think about that is corresponding to that one. But it's a virtual vector meson, meson gauge boson, lepton anti lepton pair, meson anti meson pair, quark anti quark. Take your pick. You can put anything you want in between there and then make it as long as you say it is going to be living for a short amount of time so that Heisenberg will come to your rescue. You're okay. You're okay. Now, 
none of the other physical gauge bosons are also elementary either not only that i showed you z boson is a composite of two things you know the w bosons which we all talk about they see the funny thing is you have got mathematically speaking you got three eigen no not three three components w1 w2 w3 and uh, the w3 has got the isospin projection zero it has got zero charge electric charge if speaking but w1 w2 are more like a raising and lowering operators that's what we have there and so what we call the positive w is nothing but this w1 w2 superposition with a plus sign and is just like we're doing the raising and lowering operators. So the point is, what the, the theory prescribes the W1, W2, W3, those W1, W2 are not real eigenstates of any physical system. And the one which is physical system, which, which is the eigenstate of a physical system, is not a pure configuration. This is, I mean, we are selling it. We have been selling it. We are, we are doing it. We are doing a very good job of selling it. So physical gluons, of, we talk about gluons, right? Oh, they, those are the things they're really doing. Physical gluons are not elementary. Elementary gluons are not physical. Ding. That's what it is. You got eight gluons there. I can write them all the RB bar. This, these are the color combinations, color and anti-color combinations which you have there. And then imaginary components, real components, you can put, put all of these. My eight gluons are represented like that. So if I take a physical gluon, it has it is a configuration mixing. If I take the uh, elementary gluon, it's not physical. Turn your top call. <laughs> this is another, another story. In fact, what happened you know, in 1994, I still remember this very well. I was in Taiwan at a conference of the particle physics. Fermi lab guy came and gave the talk about the top quark discovery. He said the preliminary result we are just working out and so forth. A week later, that was published <laughs> in the physical review letters. So, so then he said, Oh my goodness, he came and told us you are doing the preliminary work, but you already have got this uh, in your bag, of course. So, do you think of the term anti proton, anti proton uh, uh, collisions, in fact? You know the language that they use in the laboratory and among themselves are in the publications. They don't talk about the proton anti proton collisions. In fact, they talk about quark anti quark interactions. In fact, that's all they talk about. And I talked to my students, my former students who were working in with these groups at LAS and CMS and so forth. They said, "Come on, guys, do you make a say you're, you're showing the proton and the anti proton? Why don't you call that?" Oh no, this is what we do. The common language is that. So here you have a get a picture here, quark and anti quark. Uh, fusing it to give, give us giving it a glue on, which is not a physical this one, and it becomes a top and anti top quark this one, and then which again becomes into a bottom quark and bot anti bottom quark, which just they call that one, and then W plus and W minus quark. Look at this picture here, in fact. Stop, pause for one second there. You see the B jet and B bar jet are flying away from the interaction region. Implication would be that there's a fractal charge in that, right? There are, of course, the jets are meson jets, and there are hadronic jets, for basically what you'll find. Mostly there are mesons which are flying out. You are detecting those meson jets which are going in two different directions, and then saying, yeah, I see the B jet and B bar jet charge. B bar is probably giving the positive charge excess, and then B is giving the negative charge excess. You're saying, I found a quark jet. But if I stick to this figure uh, literally, this will tell me that a B quark has left the interaction region as a free quark. And then it decayed by emitting the jets in fact. If so, there must be a fractional charge inside that. Nobody would touch that. Nobody would even mention that. Then of course you got the W. So ultimately what you're detecting, you're detecting the, uh, uh, the, uh, the electron pair, positron pair, the muon pair, or, or combination of such, such kind of thing which you got there, corresponding to what you can see with the W plus W minus divisions in fact, and then you're saying, I found a top one in fact. So each jet carries a fraction charge, which you have got there. So what is, how do you measure the mass of the top part? So this is the data, which you got the latest information that you can get from the uh, lab, the SESAN website and particle data groups website, in fact. The so-called production cross-section of this particular the particle pair has been measured from about 2 GeV, 2 TeV, sorry, about 1.5 TeV, all the way up to about 13 TeV in fact. So you got the cross-sections measured at uh, some data points which you have onto that. 
and that comes from several experiments at last cms and lhcb cdf fermi lab etc etc which you got out of that one and then what they're doing is the following that they're using the pillow one using the two kinds of one is the pp collisions when they the proton anti-proton collisions and they got the two data set points which they have put there and the two kinds of colors in fact and this is the best fit curve best fit curve to these data points uh, demands or or implies the mass of 170.5 of course i have not measured any charged particle masses here like like a traditional uh, either the bending in the uh, magnetic field to measure their masses and reduce from there or using the invariant mass disk all other is ignored basically we have a totally completely different way of approaching here we are simply saying i'm going to take the data from all the laboratories as for the cross sections are concerned which i'm going to make next to next leading order next to next to next leading orders whatever you got there and then i'm going to calculate that one and if my model parameters under my standard mode description or whatever it is is going to fit my data mass as a parameter that's what they've done here mass is a parameter that they use to fit the cross section data and then declare from there Things should be said about the virtual particles because this also comes into this one. So in our discussions, in fact, the virtual particles are the, the very we give ourselves a lot of freedom by calling them a virtual particles. Indeed, the this, this is uh, a, 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 again we resort to Heisenberg's principle to tell us that okay, delta e delta t is less than or equal to h bar h over h over to whatever we have onto that one. Then the thing is the particles mass are not constant to the nominal masses. I can use any number I want depending upon my situation, of course. And then they can also have the particles which are not limited to the, which are not allowed by the real particles. For a, a good example is the photon. Photon, we always argue that a real photon is a transverse photon, electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other and perpendicular to the direction of motion of this one. But we have virtual longitudinal photons, of course. And we use it commonly, routinely. Elastic scattering of the electrons, electron scattering of the muons with respect to the, with the, uh, the target nucleus. Which, which is does not accept the nuclear is purely described with the longitudinal photons in fact again we use that one even on the in, in elastic scattering process also to understand how much of longitudinal component how much of the transverse component are present in fact and the question is mass wise so particle could be any mass for example take the example of nuclear beta decay which i never accept i've been working with this in fact that is the role of w boson we said it is intermediate the, take a neutron decay into proton I got 939.5 MeV in the initial state, 938.3 in the final state, plus an electron, which is 938.8 or so, which you got there. So about half an MeV, 0.8 MeV, free energy, which is going to fly go around. W boson is mediating this. Q is less than one MeV, in fact. And then my W boson, if it is on the mass shell, it has got 81 GeV. Where does the energy come from? Oh, off mass shell. Off mass shell. I'm home and dry. Nothing to worry about it. Generations of quartz and leptons. Oh, these are beautiful pictures you will find everywhere, right? The quartz and leptons, you've got three generations of quartz and three generations of leptons. How beautiful they are aligned in the hadron sector and lepton sectors. And here I've got the four gauge bosons which are sitting as a fundamental particles. I should just show you they are not fundamental, but would, nobody knows that. As long as nobody knows they're okay, home and dry. So we have got that one there. We can put that one there. And then we've got this one and then publicize it, go around and talk to people, in fact. But what is that? Quarks are not that simple pictures, in fact. There are left-handed doublets, right-handed singlets, right-handed charged leptons, no right-handed neutrinos. So already what I showed as a very simple three-generation quarks, and quarks, that's only half story. That's not a complete story. Not only that, you have got this one. So you can mix matrix into right down here. These are the physical quarks which I wrote down for the bottom layer of this thing, D prime, S prime, B prime, we call that one. And then mathematical quarks are the D and S and B. So physical quarks are not elementary in, in their sense because they've got a mixing matrix. Without that, I cannot understand what the parity violation is, what the CP violation is, et cetera, et cetera. So I put this one and then calculate, spend my life to calculate. So physical quarks are not elementary. Elementary quarks are not physical. And they're not, they're not that nice figure I'm putting all over the, all over the public's uh, social media, in fact. Neutrino, same thing. 
they, in fact, this concept was borrowed from the quark sector anyways. They, they borrowed from that particular one. So you got here new and new to new three that are called mathematical neutrinos, which you got there. And what we call the physical neutron, new, 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 new tau, are the superpositions of, the, of this one. So again, the same argument, which we, we are, we are basically borrowing one from the other and repeating the same thing. And as long as we got there, we are just fine and dandy. That's what you're doing in this case. And again, they will tell you if, oh, the, the big question right now is the following. Which way it is? Is the new one lower or the new one the topmost one? Or depending upon this one, I'm going to understand the cosmology because the mass inverse is the mass hierarchy of the neutron, mathematical neutrons they're talking about. Depending upon that, they can tell me how the dark matter, dark energy, and how the cosmology is going to all evolve. So we should really find out the mathematical sequence, how, we, how these are applied, appearing. Whether the new one, new three are closer, or new three is closer, or whatever is happening. And there's a lot of activity that's going on right now, in fact. So, so to summarize, basic physical entities are not elementary and fundamental mathematical entities are not physical. Come to Higgs boson. I'm getting close to the end. If I'm getting tired, I don't know how much I'm doing with the time, but you are very patient people. So this is claimed to be detected in the decay model of two photons. But the thing is, photons are not supposed to interact with the uh, with Higgs boson. Even though photon is 30% Z boson, right? If you ignore that one, so photon has no mass because photon does not interact with the Higgs boson. Then you say, why is it that this is going to be my best? This, of course, the cross section is low, they claim for that one, but they said this much cleaner way for detecting that they found it. And as you can see, that one, uh, and it was already recognized by the time the sun went on to do this experiment. Fermi lab was already claiming that the mass is somewhere between 140 to 130 and so on and so forth, which you got their GVs on that. And so there is a, a several multi-million events of which you have got this, uh, you can see the about 10,000 thing which you got, this bump which you have seen. From the bump, they have found that uh, there, there's a two gamma invariant mass. They would say that they found this little one. And then maybe in that sense, this is better than the top of discovery in the sense that we are talking about invariant mass, Rather than talking the cross sections into the other one, in fact. So, so let's ask, okay, we have done it. Let's ask the question what does Higgs do for us? What, what, what is this? What is this about it, basically? So, if, if you give me a mass of a particle and if you tell me whether it's a fermion or a boson, I can tell you the interaction strength and vice versa. That's right. So, proton is 1836 times heavier than electron. So, proton interaction is, uh, with Higgs is equal to 1836 times that of electron. Thank you very much. My job is done. And mass of Fermi is coupled with Higgs. Mass of Boson is the square of, the, of its coupling with Higgs. So both of them have to know, oh, I'm Higgs, I'm a boson, or I'm seeing a boson, so what I'm going to do. Does it tell us, or, or we just say it? What, 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 what are we getting out of this kind of a description? Is it something I just I try to argue that I'm finding it? And these uh, couplings are an isospin space. This is uh, a Heisenberg introduced isospin space. It's a very powerful tool, extremely powerful tool in particle physics and nuclear physics. I use it a lot. I love it, in fact. But we should be aware that's isospin space, not the physical space. It's a complex mathematical space. And if somebody tells me the whole universe is filled with a Higgs field, I say, excuse me, what are you talking about? OK. There's nothing physically fundamental or elementary anymore in particle physics according to present day models. Not all is lost. This is one thing we want to say. Indeed, we have an excellent news for the 21st, 20th and 20th century particle physics. Your job is done. We found the Rosetta Stone of Democritus. What is that? Your new they are proton, neutron, and electron. They are indivisible. They transform into one another, but they, they don't totally disappear. Baryon number conservation, which works so beautifully, we don't know why it works. And that really guarantees to you the number of nucleons in the universe remains constant. That, that, that is, uh, yeah, uh, that, 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 that it works. And we don't know why it works, but it, that, that, uh, and that makes proton and neutron at the same level, in fact. And then electron is an entity which you have got by the side of it, whichever. If the particle fit, with what happened, uh, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. So, so if, if they were looking for the reductionism, we already found the proton, neutron, and electron. That was there already. We, we, we saw that in the 1930s, we already got this in fact. 
But then there was a lot of uh, uh, interest in fact, back in, started from 1930s onwards, in fact. So they, they, we have got this idea, uh, higher the energy, you get closer to the, uh, to the center. So the interaction is shorter range, so you can probe deeper and deeper with the different momentum transfers and so on and so forth. So they went out to higher and higher energy with the, uh, with the, uh, with the thinking that they could unravel the dynamics of the physical systems at all momentum transfers and energy certain points. Right? Root shock. Nature said you are looking at pinatas. They did not expect the prions and kaons and bromesons and all these things to produce in copious amount. Multiple pons flying out in the laboratory, in fact. So this is like a pinatas. You are like a child playing, and then but the, the child is probably yeah has got has, has got a advantage of she gets she it, she or she gets some nice candies of course, and then particle physics also got their candies, lots of mesons, but not what they expected, but not what they were looking for in fact. So last side which you got there, this is something which you found. Everything should be as simple as it can be, but not simpler. This is attributed to Einstein through a music composer. In fact, we found it very interesting. Yeah? And we did go back and check the music composers. Uh, this one, he said he heard from somebody Einstein told. So the same way he also says music composition also should be using that one. In fact, and here it is uh, one some, some simple summary. Think about how what's going on in terms of the reductionism fundamentality. If you think about it, we talk about the thought processes, mental events, emotions, and uh, other things that you got there, for which they don't exist any physical models. We don't have any physical models for that. In fact. The first thing that we can find as a tangible thing is, of course, a brain, either human or otherwise. There's something which you can call the brain, which is uh, which is really making. So that's where you start really trying to see how things are behaving. That's a tangible thing we can try to start making some physical models, if you want to call it. Then, of course, you go a bit deeper. You got the cells, of course. So the, it's made up of the cells which you got there. So further reduction is will take you to the molecules. Molecular systems which you got, there. and then you can go to the atoms, of course, which you got atoms and molecules are created. And if you go further deeper onto that, by the even the early last century, we already found out there are the nucleons and electrons, in fact. And our quest to go deeper onto that one, to go further reductionism, led us to what we show on the other right hand side. This is what we call the non physical, or oh, what happened? Oh, this disappeared. Oh, this, oh, oh, sorry. So the square that uh, uh, I don't know where, where it came from. It's a non physical models, in fact. We call that non physical. Model. We had a, a good discussion with our publisher, in fact. They thought that we put it non physical by mistake. So I said, no, 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 no. We did not. We really meant it. By the time you lost this total one, you came into models. Your models are becoming non physical with no direct relation to the reality of nature. In fact, you are making up things. They're effective models, if you want to call that way. But do we really need to get make effective models at the, at the uh, at, to what extent? To what extent? To what extent? What is the purpose of those effective models in terms of understanding the nature? In fact, we have to ask that. Problem. So, if you think about that way, we believe that the bottom has been reached by the time we got the neutrons and electrons and so forth. And this is the last, in fact. So, uh, APJ Abdul Kalam. I don't think many people would know him. He was a, an ISRO of the Indian Space Research Organization's uh, chief scientist, director, and so forth. He was the one who put the India into the space uh, missions and so forth. And uh, 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 he died at the age of 83 while while giving lecture to the students. In fact. And I, I happened to travel in India at that time. I was so touched that uh, this man at the age of 83, as a volunteer, he was giving an evening lecture to some graduate students or whatever it is. While delivering his lecture, he stopped, collapsed, and died. But he was interviewed by the Time magazine by 19, in 1990 also. And he said one thing there that he said, science is a beautiful gift to humanity. We should not distort it. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Today's particle physics is a total distortion of science, and uh, I'm 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 hurt with that. Thank you and merci.